Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, the editor of Crux, your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic journalism. You can find us online at cruxnow.com. And this is Last Week in the Church. This is Crux's signature, showcase, peak, well, and only video offering in which, and this is the show in which we usually take kind of stale news because it happened a week ago, and then we cook it up with some special spice and, you know, make it seem fresh. However, we don't have to do that this week because there was big news last night. So today we are cooking with fresh ingredients, fresh catch, ladies and gentlemen. Pope Francis went on TV to, to give an interview. Now, in itself, the fact that the Pope gave an interview is probably not that big of a deal. He's done it many, many times before. But this was on Italy's most popular late-night talk show. This was the equivalent, ladies and gentlemen, of the Pope going on the Stephen Colbert show or Jimmy Fallon or, back in the day, David Letterman. And it has never actually happened before. It happened once under John Paul, but that was a call-in. But this is the first time a pope is actually set down in person with a talk show host to answer all manner of questions. And so we are going to break down all of that for you. B before we get to that, though, let me just say, if you are watching this, you will notice you're doing so on Tuesday rather than our normal Monday. That is because we've sort of made the decision that what happens? Let me just lift a, a curtain into our world. The people who do what we in the entertainment business call post-production are scattered in time zones all over the world. And when we shoot this Monday morning in Rome, it has to get to them, and then they have to work their magic in order to make this even borderline watchable. And all that, frankly, just takes more time than a single day gives in order to consistently get it right. So, to make life comfortable for everybody, this is now going to be a Tuesday program going forward. You will find it the same place you always find it, YouTube, it, wherever you get your, your video productions. But it just, it will be released one day later, Tuesday rather than Monday. All right, please stick around because we've got a lot for you this week. All right, happy Monday to you. Thanks for spending part, well, sorry, I'm an idiot. I'm operating on an old script. Happy Tuesday to you, and thanks for spending part of your Tuesday with us. As I said at the top of the show, big news here on the Vatican Beat is Pope Francis on the talk show. This is an Italian talk show called Che Tempo Che Fa. It basically sort of means, it's usually phrased as a question, and it kind of means how's the weather. It's being used metaphorically here to just, what's going on? How are things? And it's been around since 2013. It is hosted by a very well-known Italian broadcaster by the name of Fabio Fazio, who, as I say, is kind of the equivalent of a Jimmy Fallon or a Stephen Colbert figure. A little less funny than those guys. Probably a little bit more of a serious journalist than those guys. But nevertheless, the show usually focuses on, like, big personalities out of pop culture. Like, back in December, he had Lady Gaga on the show, and, and that was the big broadcast. By the way, it was his highest ratings of the year were for Lady Gaga. But he, he scored even bigger last night because he had on no less a pop culture icon and no less a global pope, point of reference than Pope Francis. So I, I want to break down this for you in three components. First, we'll go over what the Pope said. It should come with a warning label that it's really nothing you haven't heard from Pope Francis before in any sense. Do try to bear in mind, though, it was very fresh and new to the people who were watching this show, who, as I say, are more accustomed to listening to interviews with Leonardo DiCaprio and Lady Gaga than they are with Popes. Second, I will go over how this interview came about, because it's interesting in and of itself. And then third, a, a kind of footnote of controversy about how the, inter the interview was presented. Let's begin with the content. No big surprise, I suppose, 
that Pope Francis, probably the, to the extent there were headlines out of this, they focused on the issue of migration. Immigrants, migrants, and refugees are, of course, this pope's, in, in many ways, they're his signature issue. They're the only arena of the Vatican in which he has a whole department dedicated just to one issue, which he supervises himself personally. And he's put one of his most trusted guys, Canadian Cardinal Michael Cherney, in charge of it. So the Pope talked at some length about migration in this interview, was asked a number of questions about it. As I say, in the main, nothing we haven't heard before. He talked about how what happens to migrants and refugees is they try to make their way from North Africa across the Mediterranean to Europe is, and this is the word he used, criminal. What he said, the way they are treated is criminal. He was talking to the fact that often what will happen is these migrants and refugees get on these rickety, unsafe dinghies that they're trying to use to get across the Mediterranean. Then some ship sponsored by an NGO will come in to rescue them. And then that ship is denied permission to, to pull into port in a series of European countries. They end up floating out there for indetermined periods until somebody breaks down and is willing to receive them. Often these people will suffer from malnutrition, dehydration. They usually get on those dinghies in the first place with serious health problems that go untreated during this limbo period. And Pope Francis described all of that as criminal. He also discussed, and again, this is a line he has used many times before, how the Mediterranean has become the largest cemetery in Europe and how tragic that is. Now, the Pope did acknowledge that every country has a right to determine how many migrants it can receive. And he said, you know, we can say we can receive this number and we can't go beyond that. But he said, no matter how migrants arrive, whether they're within those limits or not, he said, when they do show up, they need to be welcomed, they need to be cared for, and they need to be integrated. As an example of the breakdown of integration, Pope Francis cited, the bombings at the Brussels airport in 2016, which he noted were carried out by young men, all of whom had been born and grew up in Belgium, but they were the children of migrant families that had been kind of shoved into a ghetto and segregated. And the Pope suggested that that's what radicalized them and led to this, this act of violence. And so all in all, you know, a kind of clarion call from Pope Francis for acceptance, tolerance, compassion, and integration of migrants. Again, nothing that people who pay close attention to Pope Francis haven't heard countless times. Presumably, though, for this audience, perhaps, it was new and therefore important. The Pope also discussed war. He linked the phenomenon of migration actually to war, talked about the situation in Yemen, for example. Conflict's been going on for almost a decade, and he said, you know, nobody in the international community does anything about it. But then when people try to flee that war, we treat them like criminals, suggesting there's a fair degree of hypocrisy involved uh, in all of that. The Pope went on to link war to a kind of deep, I don't know, I mean, original sin, I guess you would say. I mean, he noted that war goes all the way back to Cain and Abel, right? And then the fallout of the Tower of Babel. And he, he talked about it as an instinct of anti-creation, you know, that God is the creator. And what God inspires builds up. He, he set the example, he, he cited the examples of people who, you know, have jobs and who contribute to the community, who raise families. He said all of these are creative things. They, they construct. The instinct to war, on the other hand, is, is the instinct to destroy. And he almost suggested it's written into the fabric of a world marked by sin. But that doesn't mean we can't lament it. The Pope made the observation that if we shut down the global arms trade for just one year and took the money that circulates in that trade, and devoted it to feeding people and educating people, we could solve the problems of global hunger and we could solve the problems of illiteracy and failures in education 
overnight. And yet, he said, there just isn't the will to do it. And he said, that's a hard, ugly truth, but it is the truth. The Pope also talked about climate change. Again, no surprise for the first Pope in history who issued his own eco-encyclical. And among other things, the Pope talked about the fact that he, he met not long ago with this group of fishermen from a small Italian town on the Adriatic coast who, over the course of one year in their fishing expeditions, had collected three tons of plastic. And he talked about how throwing plastic into the sea is an assault on Mother Nature, on Mother Earth, and it's just bad. He, he also talked about deforestation in the Amazon, once again, talking about how that's an assault on Mother Earth praised the way aboriginal peoples in the Amazon live in harmony with nature and said we need to learn something from him, from them. Again, no big surprise, classic Pope Francis. He also talked about the church, so there was a kind of odd intro dimension to all of this. Pope Francis, as he has many times before, said the worst evil in the church today is worldliness. That is, treating the church like a path to career advancement or like a secular corporation and kind of looking out for yourself as opposed to the spirit of sacrifice and communion the church calls us to feel with other people. He said that worldliness in the church leads by a short path to clericalism, which as we all know is public enemy number one for Pope Francis and, you know, delivered his usual critique of clericalism, the idea that by virtue of being clergy, you're more important, more worthy than someone else, to the exclusion of the lay role and, and so forth. Once again, all very familiar territory, but probably not for the audience that was tuning in last night. And we don't have the overnight ratings numbers, by the way, yet. But that Lady Gaga interview got six million people. I mean, it's entirely possible that at least six million people, maybe more, were watching Pope Francis last night. Very few of them, given the demographics of this show's audience, probably are all that familiar with what he usually has to say. So, you know, may not be new to viewers of this program, probably was fairly new to a lot of people who tuned in last night. All right, how did this interview come about? Because that's always an interesting question, right? Like, I don't have the actual numbers, but my guess is, in any given week, there are at least 100 interview requests that come in to the Vatican in one way, shape, or form. Some of them will go to the Vatican press office. Some of them will go to a, a well-placed cardinal that an Italian journo happens to know. Some of them will go to the Pope himself, based on people he's met over the years, and so on. So the question always is, why this one, right? Why did the Pope do this? Well, the backstory is this. Among the new movements in the Catholic Church is an outfit called the Community of New Horizon. It was founded by an Italian laywoman lay named Chiara Amirante. She's a native Roman. When she was young, in the 80s, she had a terminal diagnosis with a very severe disorder and basically thought she was going to die, as did her family. People were making preparations and so on. And then, sort of inexplicably, at least from a medical point of view, she recovered. She experienced this as a miraculous grace from God and decided to try to devote herself to trying to, to help people. And so she began in impoverished Roman neighborhoods setting up centers of welcome, asking young people to join her, trying to serve the city's most vulnerable and marginalized forgotten populations. That then grew into founding what are called, what are they in English? It would be kind of a heavenly citadel, I guess. It's a cittadella di del cielo. So heavenly citadel. I think they call them sky citadels, actually, in English. But in any event, these are larger communities where anybody who is having trouble and who feels alone can show up. They can live on a short or long-term basis. 
they will get counseling, they will get job assistance, and, and so forth and so on. Amarante is also very big into the new evangelization, trying to bring people to the faith, and the Sky Citadel serves that function as well. Pope Francis got to know this movement when he first arrived in Italy, kind of watching it at a distance and liking what he saw. In 2019, September, he decided to make a visit to the Cittadella del Cielo of this movement, which is located in Frosinone, that's a town outside Rome where the movement's headquarters are. He spent a day there. One of the people he met there was a well-known Italian journalist named Fabio Fazio, who had himself become attracted to this movement and had decided he wanted to be part of it. He's actually a member. He was there the day Francis was there. The two apparently had long conversations and warm conversations. A year later, in an interview with La Repubblica, Pope Francis cited something Fazio had written. It was, it was basically about not paying your taxes, <laughs> uh, which, uh, you know, in Italy is a huge thing because tax evasion here is like the country's favorite indoor sport. I mean, the tax rates here are ridiculously high because so many people don't pay their taxes, and it's kind of an ongoing thing. Pope Francis has spoken about it many times, including recently. Fazio had written a piece in which he said that if you don't pay your taxes, you're not just doing something wrong, you're committing a crime. Because in the era of coronavirus, every tax dollar that isn't paid is one fewer nurse we can put in a hospital, it's one fewer re respirator we can afford to purchase to keep someone, someone alive. He basically was saying, this is indirectly, you're committing murder. And Pope Francis referred to that piece very favorably. Apparently, since that meeting in Frozenone in 2019, Fazio has been working towards trying to get an interview with Pope Francis. And, you know, the coronavirus slid things down and just, you know, distractions slid things down. But it has been in the works ever since. And in this case, what we have to understand is that I don't think Pope Francis felt he was doing a favor to Rai, which is the Italian national broadcaster, Rai Tre specifically, that is their third channel, which is where this show uh, appears. I, I don't think it was about them, although frankly, around the Vatican, being on Rai is considered pretty cool. But I don't think that was the fundamental thing. I think Pope Francis likes this movement. He likes the effect this movement has had on this journalist's life and his priorities, and so was doing it for that reason. Finally, there was a bit of a mini controversy about how this interview was presented. Let me just tell you, going in, those of us in the Vatican Press Corps, we didn't know if this interview was going to be live or pre-recorded. Now, we assumed it probably had to be pre-recorded, in part because Rai trucks had been seen in the Vatican on, yeah, on Sunday at around 5 o'clock in the afternoon, but there were no trucks there at broadcast time, which was around 9 o'clock. So, you know, it didn't look like, I mean, to us, it didn't seem very likely that this was going to be a live thing. But when you tuned into the show, and of course we all did Sunday night, for all the world, it seemed like this was a live broadcast. So the host for the first 45 minutes was sitting at his desk, he had guests, they were talking about other things. Then, wearing the same clothes and without taking a breath, he pivots to, and now we're bringing in Pope Francis. And there was Pope Francis, in the Apostolic Library, the, the Bibliotheca in the Vatican, sitting in, in a chair in front of a camera, you know, with the, the library in the, in the background. And the, the, Rye, the, the broadcast, never said a word about this being pre-recorded. I would think that the vast majority of people who tuned into this show last night thought they were watching a live conversation, probably still think that today. Now, if you were paying careful attention, it did seem, listening to the audio, that there were obvious cuts. I mean, when Pope Francis was talking, there was a little bit of background noise. 
then he would stop. When the host was talking, there was a little bit of background noise, but there would be moments of dead silence in between that just did seem like they represented stuff, you know, like cutting room stuff, right? Like there were bits missing. And if you were watching obsessively, as some of our Italian colleagues were, you would have noted that at one stage, the Pope had his watch showing while he is talking. And 30 seconds apart, it shows 5.30 p.m. and then it shows 5 p.m. I mean, that's not a live broadcast, folks. So the question is, why didn't Rai just say this out loud? Now, in fairness, they put out a press release the morning after the broadcast in which they acknowledged it had been pre-recorded. But it was deeply irritating to a lot of people, mostly journalists, I should say, that it seemed like they wanted to have their cake and eat it too, right? They wanted to accommodate the Pope by pre-recording him, but they wanted their audience to think that they were hearing him in real time. And it just goes to show you that, you know, like, sometimes transparency is the best medicine. Like, Rye could have saved itself an enormous headache at, at no cost, really, to, to the broadcast simply by saying this has been pre-recorded. I mean, do you really think fewer people would have tuned in to watch knowing the Pope had done the interview four hours beforehand as opposed to in that moment? I mean, it doesn't seem like it. So moral of the story is probably this. In the 21st century, in an era in which, basically speaking, nothing is private anymore, when you are engaging in public broadcasting, it probably doesn't make any sense to try to pull a fast one on in your audience. My guess would be that in post-production meetings in Rye today, they are probably drawing the same conclusion. Speaking of conclusions being drawn, I should add, that in some sectors of the Italian Catholic blogosphere and social media, there is a very disapproving take on this whole thing, on the whole idea of the Pope going on a talk show. Critics see this as part of the progressive secularization of the papacy, the lack of any transcendent dimension to this papacy, that he wants to be a pop star more than a pope. And there is that drumbeat of criticism. I, I would just note that make of that what you will, but this is hardly just a Pope Francis thing. I mean, remember, John Paul II called in to an Italian TV talk show. John Paul II put out his own CDs, okay? John Paul II was good friends with a number of pop culture artists. And Benedict XVI, despite being, by nature, a much more cerebral character, did the same thing. I mean, he put out a children's book based on conversations with his cats, okay? This is what pop culture icons do. And I think the determination of recent popes has been that if they want to, as John Paul put it, popes today have to be not just Peter, they also have to be Paul. That is, they have to be the church's evangelist in chief. And if you're going to do that, you got to go where people are. And let's face it, late night talk shows are where an awful lot of people are who don't normally hear the church's message. So there you are. All right, that is our show for this week. Thank you for joining us. We will be back here next Tuesday and every Tuesday until the eschaton, until Armageddon bringing you last week in the church. In the meantime, have a fantastic and blessed week. Stay safe. Stay healthy. We will talk to you again soon.